live. Um, what I would do, let me just welcome everyone to the panel. And first of all, I feel like a total imposter. Um, we have the most amazing lineup of speakers with us and I'm gonna do my best to stay out of the way because the people you wanna hear from are the people that are about to come up. A very quick introduction to the, who we've got. We've got a Nobel Peace nominee. We've got a Commonwealth ambassador. We've got Somalia's first surf coach. We have a national surfing champion. So I'll let you guess who they are as we go through. Um, but yeah, a quick introduction to the organizations. We have um, Shafi and Ilwad from the incredible Elman Peace. They're based out in Somalia and Mogadishu. Uh, they're doing a lot of work to reintegrate uh, young people into society there who've been afflicted by the, uh, the conflict situation there. We've got Chris Dennis from Trinidad from Waves for Hope. Um, and we have Mesa Leone from the Mesa Leone Foundation in Sierra Leone as well. So they're gonna be talking to us a little bit about their experience bringing surfing to their country because surfing is quite new as you can imagine to a lot of these places and also the kind of the concept of surf therapy. Broadly, what we're gonna be speaking about is, is where does surf therapy sit in these types of countries? If you can imagine a lot of the panels that we've we've had over the last few days, um, a few days, it feels like the last few days, but um, okay. the surf therapy programs themselves, they're kind of integrated into some kind of, some kind of existing service. So they're, they're attached onto a hospital program or a health program somewhere, um, and they're very much integrated. But there are countries out there and there are people like uh, these amazing individuals you're going to meet who are doing this in countries where the system doesn't exist, where their program is the system. Um, and it's a very unique approach. It's a very challenging approach. Um, and they really are breaking enormous boundaries to, to bring this work to their country. So it's, it's a huge pleasure to introduce uh, Ilwad, Shafi, Chris and Mesa. Um, I'm gonna hand over to you guys with the first question. A quick caveat for everyone. We are all over the world in this panel. So we've tried to prepare as best we can, but um, yeah, guys, hopefully no curveball questions. Um, and I'll, I'll ask you guys the first one. Um, so yeah, Ilwad and Shafi, I'll, I'll start with you guys. Obviously, you're based in Mogadishu um, in Somalia, and I, I suppose we can imagine the types of challenges that young people growing up there face. Um, I think rather than diving into the challenges, which I think we can all imagine, what, could you just give us a little bit of context to Mogadishu? Like, what are the services that exist for young people in Mogadishu? First of all, thank you very much, Tim, for having us on part of this very important conversation, one that is very near and dear to the, the ethos and mission of Elman Peace, but also to our personal journeys as practitioners working in Somalia. So just to frame the context in which we're working, Somalia has been in conflict for nearly 30 years now. The population, an overwhelming majority is under the age of 30, 70%, 44% of that are under the age of 15. We are essentially a nation of children, children who have grown up in war. And there's been a lot of humanitarian efforts. There's been early recovery, there's been food and shelter, assistance has been provided over the last three decades. But mental health, psychosocial support has always been viewed as something more lofty, something that you invest in after war, a box that you tick once there is stability. And we find it to be an a contributor to why we have this protracted conflict. This cycle of violence keeps continuing because people have become desensitized to it and it's become normalized. The work that we do at Elman Peace is focused on a theory of change on three key pillars, providing essential services to victims that have been affected by war, whether they're survivors of sexual gender-based violence, children armed conflict, displaced communities. The second pillar, is creating social norms change, working within the community, trying to prevent these abuses from happening. And then the third is working with the local governments to create policy change so that these terrible things don't continue to happen. But we realize that we're often serving the same people on numerous occasions because we're setting them back out to an environment that's not any more enabling or progressive for them. And in order for us to create sustainable change in Somalia, we have to focus on changing mindsets, creating new positive identities, investing in transitional justice aims where there are no formal processes. And that all starts with the psyche. In Somalia, traditional therapy, the Western approaches of sitting in front of someone, talking about the things that you have survived is often considered ungrateful or weak even. 
how dare you speak about the things that you were lucky to survive. And we were constantly hitting a roadblock to be able to support people in the healing journey. So we tried to look at what are the things that promote community. Don't put someone just on the spot about the trauma they faced. How can we use natural resources, the elements that can help someone continue to cope after they leave our program? And that's how we got involved with surf therapy, but the landscape is still very new on what the traditional or available services are right now. Oh, well, thank you. I mean, it's, it's a huge task that you guys face in changing mindsets, changing landscapes. It's, it's a massive challenge. And you can hear like the, the basket of services that you guys are you know, looking to offer. I think what we'll do is we'll come kind of more into depth about how you were using surf therapy to change that landscape because you can see the impact that you're starting to have. But you could, yeah, I mean, you talk about, um, you know, sending people back out into this community that just doesn't have the infrastructure. So you can see how integrated you guys are in that, in that system. I think to a, a similar degree, Chris, uh, um, Chris Dennis out in Trinidad, I know that you're kind of in, in the rural part of the country out in Balandra, where similarly, there's, there's not a huge amount going on. The challenges that young people face there might be quite difficult, different, sorry, to, to what's happening in Mogadishu, but I think that sense of of isolation and that that island of support that you offer is still very much there. You, tell us a little bit about uh, about Balandra, about Trinidad, about about you know the services that are on offer to to the young people there. Well, it's hi. I'm um, firstly I'm honoured to be able to to get on a platform such as this to discuss these amazing initiatives about people doing surf therapy around the world. Trinidad. It's Trinidad and Tobago. We are two islands and um, we are approximately 1.3 million people. Um, our mental health system is hospital based. And um, the statistic says that one in every four persons has a mental health disorder here in Trinidad. Um, surf therapy and surfing in general Firstly, in Trinidad and Tobago, is kind of viewed as a sport that privileged people do. It's 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 viewed as a sport, but only privileged people do. So there is the uh, the mindset and the stereotype that that comes with that when you bring um, surfing into um, rural communities, much less when you you add the element of of therapy, because we still have a lot of taboo or, or, or stigma attached to, to therapy where um, we have one major um, institute in Trinidad in the city for therapy and um, there are 31 outpatient mental health facilities available throughout the country but only one of this one of these facilities is for kids so obviously it's not enough. Um, our program at Waves of Hope is, is unique in Trinidad and Tobago. Using surfing and fusing it with therapy is kind of unheard of. As a matter of fact, um, in the Caribbean, I think we are um, the first to do this. Um, in saying that, obviously there's a lot of challenges and um, because of the stigmas attached to, surf, to surfing, then mental health issues here in Trinidad, you get challenges where people don't, don't um, view or see the value. However, we enjoy um, the challenge because we enjoy trying to, to really prove them wrong. And when our first, um, our first report came out, our first impact assessment came out. It just, it came out a couple of months ago. Um, it was quite encouraging, not only for, for us as an NGO, but also for the wider community, those who, who know about us. Chris, thank you. It's again, like listening to you talk and the, you know, the, the statistic you used about, you know, one in four people in, in Trinidad and Tobago having a mental health challenge and having that one outpatient uh, facility in, in the uh, in the city and I know we talk you know relatively frequently and I know the city is from where you are is quite a long drive away it's you know it's several hours in a car 
it, again, similar to what Ilwed was saying, it just shows like the, the, the importance of your interventions. Uh, you, know, you, you can't really deny those. And I think I was just going to ask one more question to, to Mesa and to introduce Mesa to the group. Um, Mesa obviously operating in Freetown in Sierra Leone. Mesa, so similar question to you, for, for young people growing up in, in Sierra Leone, again, the challenges across all these um, different communities are quite different, um, but that lack of resources seems to be consistent. And, and again, what you guys are doing in Sierra Leone and in Freetown, um, providing this, this surf therapy service, just, just tell us a little bit about what other services can young people in Freetown access? If, you know, if they can't get surf therapy there, what can they get? Messer, can you hear us? You're on mute. <laughs> Messer, have you got us? Um, let me see if we can unmute him. Hi, Messer, can you, can you get us? I see you've unmuted. Can you hear us? Okay. Messer, I'll give you one, one more moment just to see if you can connect and otherwise I might ask Shafi a quick question. Can you, can you hear us at all? Let us know if you can hear us and then um, we can see if we can get an answer. All right. I tell Chris, are you able to chat with Messer and just see if, if you can help? Uh, Chris Pramasio, sorry, are you able to chat quickly with, um, with Messer over WhatsApp and see if you can help him with the connection? And what I might do is ask uh, Shafi a quick question. Yeah, I'm working on it. Thanks. I'll get this cool. figured out. Cool, guys. So, yeah, I mean, what I wanted to kind of do is just initially set the scene that um, the programs that Chris and Ilwa and Shafi that you're delivering are, are relatively unique and that you really do provide this um, really vital service. The other thing that I just wanted to touch on quickly is, is surfing. You know, surfing is a relatively new sport. I mean, in, in Somalia, it's completely new. I know, Chris, in Trinidad, where you're based, um, surfing as well, it's, it's not a, a sport that's been traditionally made accessible to people. I guess my first question really is to Shafi. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Shafi now for the last few months. And um, Shafi, like the photos you send from Lido Beach and Mogadishu are pretty much the highlight of my week every single week. What's, um, can you just tell us a bit, how is surfing being received in, in Somalia? Like how, how do the young people respond to surfing and how does it help them psychologically? Yes. Hi everyone. Good evening. I'm Shafi. I'm very happy to see this panel today. Yeah, in Somalia, Surfing is a new thing. People never heard about this type of sport. And children, never. Did you hear me, guys? Yeah, we can hear you perfectly. It's and oh, tell us, you, it's perfect, Shafi. It's fantastic. And surfing is a new sport. How how do the young people? When you guys go down to the beach in Mogadishu, in at Lido Beach, what are some of the what are some of the common kind of expressions and feelings? How how do the young people respond yeah. to surfing? Children never had it. Yeah, children never had previous experience. So when I took them to the beach, they were surprised. Some of them were very scared. They never, they were never ready to try to surfboard. As a coach, I was I was challenging to pursue them, but I was confident. I want, I was trying to help them to see this is a therapy. I'm trying to use my, as a tool to overcome the bad experience those children was associated with um, they, they, In the meantime, days after days, sessions by sessions, I receive one of our partners with his full share with curriculum as a coach. I applied this curriculum based on in context of Somalia. The web changes of therapy curriculum include positive coping techniques like breathing, exercise, meditation, activities to improve general mental health and well-being. 
as the heart of the as the heart of the every big impact, impactful youth development program is a team caring passionate mentors who provide physically, psychologically safe space for participants. To abolish those different activities weekly to make decisions unique and fun in many ways. As I coach, I open every session in my self transition to the beach. With what first activity we do every week is a tip five, tip five breathing exercise where all the members of my participants, my students from shape every Everyone will close their eyes, they start breathing in out to encourage them to focus their attention entirely on present moment. When we do mindfulness, we became aware of our thoughts and feeling, physical sensation, the environment we are, and the behavior. For instance, we use every day and every week new activities. This activity that I, I highlight. One of the activities I use for that the curriculum we, I, I had is my participant, my student is our hand. It's a way of reflecting their strength, allowing children to manage their behavior through self-awareness. These are some ways of building their self-confidence, showing that there are many things they should be proud of. In this activity, the concept is instill confidence, sense of worthiness to be appreciated their strengths. As you know, I'm working with children with different perspectives, different background. In the live environment, very, very violent. When, we, when the first time you see your, the children you are around, they're violent, anger. I have my charisma to use some of the, one of the best activities I have, like three tears. For, manage, for anger management. It's important to take another level of their behavior and aggressiveness. Which is time, three tears is, let me, let me explain to you, my friends. This three tears, T, first one, t, for taking deep breath. When you're anger, take deep breath. Second, think of the consequence. Think of the consequence. That, until it, those you believe it will help you with. This three years in management. Some of my some of my students had issue with how to deal with their aggressive behavior, coping their family members. I think we might have a, an internet freeze in Mogadishu. Shafi, can you hear us? Um, Okay. We may have what lost gonna, him. We may have lost him, but that's okay. Thank, well, thank you. And I understand that, um, that we're dealing with some quite challenging internet connections. But what, what I thought I'd do, because we have Messer online, but um, Messer, I might throw a question across to you. But Shafi, I, I just wanted to say thank Hi. you so much for sharing Hi. that. I know, um, I know Shafi, that uh, for you, it's it, you're obviously speaking in your second language here. So being able to describe some of the sessions you're doing on the beach in Mogadishu, it's very powerful. And the idea that um, you're helping young people manage their anger and you're seeing that and the idea of the, the meditation on the beach. One thing I will do after this call, I'm gonna share a photo with everyone uh, on the Hoover app as, of some of the sessions that you ran yesterday in Mogadishu and it's very, very powerful. And you can, I can imagine what it feels like to be there. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, with Mesa on the line, I thought Mesa, I might just throw a similar question across to you. Um, surfing, uh, surfing in, in Sierra Leone is fairly new, um, and obviously the, the access to services there is, is, is quite challenging. So I suppose two questions. Number one, how is surfing being received by young people in, in Freetown in Sierra Leone? And how is that helping plug some of the gaps in the, the provision of mental health services? So it's, it's kind of two questions there. Um, over to you, Mesa. Thanks, thanks, team. It's a pleasure to be part of what I'll call the, the banana team. Great people, great minds, and it's a pleasure to join you guys and to share experience from Sierra Leone. So Sierra Leone is, maybe we, we probably start with, we, why, where is Sierra Leone and Sierra Leone as a country, what it means to us. So it's a country in the West Coast of, of West Africa. So we have 
a situation where we are surrounded by water, so it's ocean. Well, we've had very difficult experience. So we are a country like in Somalia, where Alwan is from. We had war for like over a decade. We are, the systems there, we are really not working. A lot happened, people um, suffered. I am one of the lucky children who survived the brutal conflict in Sierra Leone. So I'm a testament to the challenges that young people face, both in conflict and out of conflict. And so with the question of how are we using surfing and what are the services that are available? I would like to say surfing has been one of um, the greatest thing that has happened to that country, especially with the work that we do with Waste for Change and the Wave Alliance, you know, the partner organizations we are working with, like the Mosri for the Catos, the Joy Center. You know, we have like five or so organizations that are that are very involved in the work that we do. And what it has shown is that we have been able to provide what is not in existence. And that is a unique um, situation we are faced with. And you can imagine um, the interest at the local level. So I had, um, I think from Chris there, he was quoting some statistics about the mental health situation in Trinidad and so he's in a very lucky position that he has statistics to coach. We are in a position where we do not have these statistics. We don't have this data. So I will not say four in five, I will say five in five because we've come from a very difficult experience in Sierra Leone with wars, with Ebola. Sierra Leone was the country, the hotspot for Ebola now, COVID-19. We had mudslides, so you can imagine the pressure there on people, their mental health, and the challenges we face in the country. And if there is also no data, you can also say there are no services, especially for young people. So we have this very um, popular saying in Sierra Leone that we only have one doctor, that's the psychiatrist doctor, who is like they call him Dr. Nahim. So he's the only doctor that the country has that will provide psychosocial support. And when you talk about mental health services, they are limited. And it's also a question of accessibility versus availability. So you have the services that are available, but they are not accessible, especially to young people, then there are no services, or if they are not accessible to the communities. So they are very limited. And it's a, it's a struggle in Sierra Leone um, to have these spaces where young people can come and be able to share and be able to learn and also um, experience this beauty of surfing that, that we are all enjoying. So it is a challenge there, but what we have done with the Wave Alliance and coming from South Africa, um, we've been trained with the team in Sierra Leone here, is that we've been able to use surfing as an escape route. We've been able to use surfing as the only opportunity available to us. So it's a very precious uh, mineral. We have diamonds in Sierra Leone. You must have heard about the, the diamonds from Sierra Leone, the blood diamonds. So we are now having the, the soft diamonds, which we feel are very much um, helping our young people in Sierra Leone. So we have them going to the beaches every week. I really have to pay you know, tribute to our local mentors, our coaches. I've, I've just been on the phone, we've been talking and discussing, we've had meetings, and they've expressed how much surfing has really contributed to making a difference in their lives. It's not just the mental health, but also in their physical health and being able to interact and being able to promote um, what you call in South Africa, the banana culture in Sierra Leone, we call it the one pot culture or the one word culture, or keep the peace. So that culture has really helped to shape the country. You know, we've had very traumatic experience. Just to close on this, let me tell you three stories that I want to share with you. One young people, one young person, sorry, one young person said that He's so she's ashamed, she's not able to go out, she's fearful of what people will say to that like person if, if she goes out, she's ashamed. So you see, like she's not able to go out because she she does not have that support, people to talk to. The other one will say, like in Sierra Leone, if you, you have problems with your parents, they will tell you don't come back home, you have to go back where you, you, you are from. And it's a situation where you have this many three children because 
The homes are also not able to support them. The communities do not have the services. And sometimes the services that are provided are hard or querying, maybe an NGO just come in and provide a short-term service. And when the funding basket drains, they disappear, they are no more there. And so you have a gap, it continues. So we are trying to create a system that is sustainable. We're trying to create safe spaces across the beaches in Freetown that are going to be there for a very long time, perhaps forever. And these are owned, led by young people because we feel something provides so much to us. It's not just a medication, but it's also our life. And so we value this opportunity and, and we are happy to be able to contribute to this session. And to say surfing is the only, soft therapy is the only service that we have in Sierra Leone to engage and empower young people. That's what I will say. So we are in a very um, unique position. And thank you for the opportunity presented to us. No problem, Mesa, thank you so much. I'm gonna, just a couple of things you said, and I'm, I'm gonna pass these over to Ilwad because um, as you were talking, it really made sense, but you were talking about this idea of surfing as an escape route. And I think so many people can identify with that. And I think um, I think no one's work maybe embodies that more than what Ilwad's doing in Mogadishu. But the, and the vision you've got, Master, of, of this system, the system of beaches that you need to create from the ground up, because there is no system. So what you know, what you're doing with surfing to create these these beaches that young people can come to, it's it's an incredible, incredible you know undertaking that you've taken on there. So more power to you. What I'd love to do before we finish as well is come back to some of the research that you've done and how you're sharing that with government and things, but we'll come back to that in, in a moment. But on that, on that kind of statement that you made about surfing as an escape route and building the system, Ilwad, you, the work you guys do in, in Mogadishu is, it, it's just, it's, it's, just it's, it's, it's incredible to be honest, I'm kind of lost for words. So this, this escape route that you create and this system, like how do you do that? You know, you're, you're working with young people from really, really difficult backgrounds. How do you help them? How do you build the system around them to help them wow. uh, leave their past behind? And how do you, yeah, how do you integrate surfing into that? I also wanna just quickly address the first question that you had about how was surf, surfing actually first received in Somalia? And so when we were first introducing surfing in Somalia, there's no Somali word for it. Even now we just call it surfing cup. It's still the same word, we just add cup to make it more Somali. But we had to show the kids videos of people surfing and they've seen this in movies, but never actually experienced it. So even till now, when we drive through the city and take the surfboards to the ocean, it's a novelty. We're the only people in Mogadishu right now that have surfboards and it always attracts a crowd. People are very curious. And for us, it was a really strong entry point for actually getting the kids to also take part in this process of opening up and an entry point for conversation by virtue of experiencing this fun new activity to them. And I wanna pay tribute to Shafi'i who just spoke because he literally is the father of surf, surf culture in Somalia. He is That's not only really so passionate about the work that he does, but he's basically on the front lines of witnessing the transformative potential that surf therapy has. And the research that we're doing right now with Ways for Change is really starting to build that empirical evidence base about how we can use sports and activities for treating the somatic symptoms of trauma. For us, surf therapy has created an entry point, has broken down barriers of paranoia, of mistrust, of you know, disobedience or violence with children that we otherwise couldn't get through. We've been working with children in armed conflicts for more than 20 years. The cornerstone of the organization, Ellen Peace, is based on a motto, drop the gun, pick up the pen. Our philosophy for building peace is literally having frontline soldiers hand in their weapons for a dignified alternative livelihood and opportunity. Up until this approach that commands one to be vulnerable in the ocean, to trust, to reflect on what that exercise was like, to share with people that they otherwise would not align with because they were from armed group X and they were for armed group Y. We were really struggling to actually see how we were contributing to the psychological rehabilitation. And um, 
I think surf therapy from the outside is viewed as, you know, a fun activity, um, maybe something that's more for the privileged, something you do on holiday. But in Somalia, it has the greatest potential of actually creating consistent avenues for young people to cope with the daily trauma that they face. It's free. Somalia has the longest coastline in all of Africa. We have massive untapped potential for even creating industries around ocean culture. And it's very much rooted already in Islam about the peace that the ocean brings. So all these factors combined made it a lot easier for us to integrate it into daily culture, daily life. And we're really excited about the progress that we're seeing already, the way that the kids are reacting to it. And um, I think it's really important for us to also be studying this because as you asked in the first question, what are the services and what is the system like in Somalia? There's a lot of organizations, there's a lot of NGOs. I think every actor prioritizes psychosocial counseling, but nothing is really standardized. We don't have clinical psychosocial support. There's religious avenues that people pursue that often don't um, actually treat the mental health issues, but punish people as well. So if we are able to actually build an evidence base about the power, the transformative power of things like surf therapy, we believe that it will have a much wider effect on the, the trajectory of the entire nation. And it's, um, it's a completely new space. There's very little that's been done in Somalia. And I think it's really exciting to see how surf can also be at the helms of leading that process. Awesome. Thank you. Ola. It's like just listening to you and Mesa talk, it, like I've got so much admiration from what you're doing because you really are building something from the ground up. And I think, how do you get people to listen to you? How do you get people to take you seriously, especially like in, the, in the areas that you're working in? And you can see, and, I, and hopefully we get a moment, I'm just conscious of time, but I'd love to create um, just time for you and Mesa to talk about the research component of what you're doing. So we'll circle back to that just in a moment. Um, but I just had one quick question for Chris as well. Because um, Chris, I know we were talking about this the other day um and you know in Belandra, you know you're, you're the founder of ways for hope so you, you lead your organization but you're also a coach you're in the water all the time um and you can see as Messer has spoken about Elwood has talk, spoken about um the program is it is the family it's not just a surf therapy program it's it's the heart and soul of the community for a lot of people uh, and a lot then rests on your shoulders which means you know how how do you stay positive amongst all of this so that you can be positive for the people coming to your program because that's difficult um you know for a lot of us we have support systems around us and things like that but when and i could ask the same question to oh, I'd answer mess and I, we could talk about this for days but how how do you do that in balandra because you've you've got this amazing capacity to, to smile when everything around you is not going you know as, as swimmingly as you would hope how do you stay positive so that you can be positive for the young people that come to your program <laughs> All right, thank you, Tim. Um, well, firstly, I'm a co-founder. It's my wife and I. <laughs> and um, yes, that's a real good question because one, you have to be consistent. It's one of the, the biggest things. I've been very blessed. Yes, I grew up very, very humble. and um, But I've been very blessed to have always had the ocean. So while I didn't know what surf therapy was back then, surfing has always been there to make me feel better about whatever situation. It, it, it's like the ocean was like, is literally my safe space where I can go. And almost when you take off on a wave, you, you almost only think about that. Sometimes you give yourself some space away from things and then you, you have the chance to come back and revisit it with, with new eyes and new thoughts. However, some of the same things that we teach, mindfulness, a um, bit of meditation and stuff, that I find myself using a lot of those techniques as well. Um, and yeah, you've got to practice what you, what you preach. Um, but the ocean has always been you know, my home for, for um, balance. So that's how we cope with it. <laughs> it's, yeah, it is very honorable. I think um, 
that idea of balance, I mean, how you find that in Balandra is, is just amazing. I mean, do you, give us just a, an, an understanding of what does a typical week look like for you? Um, just so we can understand like how how much do you actually provide for how the much, kids in your How much time do we have? <laughs> yeah, three minutes. Um, <laughs> so besides um, surf therapy and um, our NGO, um, personally, my week, basically I drive to the city almost every day. I'm up at 3.30 on average in the mornings, 3.30 a.m. I get to the city around 5 o'clock. And because I have other businesses as well that I, uh, I actively pursue for, for income and all of that. Then we have all our mentor trainings on a Thursday afternoon. We are uh, we are very um, grateful because we have a new batch of of mentors coming up, and they are all young young people, you know, super interesting, super um, excitable young people, which is kind of a first for us as as well, um, being able to engage young people. We, there's a lot of background work. Those of us who are involved in these programs, you would know, Tim, there's so much background work that's involved with, with running an NGO and an organization. And um, we are in the process of actually creating another safe space, which is our own center. And just to touch on um, one thing that Ilwad um, mentioned about... Um, including other aspects, not, not just surfing. We are having like a supervised homework center because you're also wanting to provide opportunities for your participants. Um, all of these, uh, it's like you're breaking boundaries. It's like you're doing new things and you're like the first persons to walk through this door. So we're learning as we go along. We're coming up on two years being a registered um, NGO and um, it's insane to look back for us for our journey and see where we have gotten now with the training from you know ways to change and but I did not know what surfing was was doing you know I just used to meet a few kids when I traveled and came back and started pushing them into waves because they were interested in the sport and um, then you started getting, starting hearing their stories about their home life or their school life, personal life, all of that. And um, it's interesting. It's interesting to see now young people in Trinidad. I mean, especially these times, we, we all have so much going on. And with the inception of, of COVID, for example, more, now more than ever, there's this need for alternative systems, you know, um, that, and I think part of our job is to make it accessible. Um, you can run a therapy program in, in, in our city, for example, that, that has nothing to do with the beach, you know, you can use skateboarding, you can use so much other thing. It's all about making it accessible. We plan to move from community to community. We have this, you know, we all have our goals and these projections and that's what we, we plan to do, just making it more accessible. And yes, creating also opportunities for, for our participants and whoever our um, target goals reach. Awesome, thank you, Chris. I think, um, yeah, the vision is admirable and I think you've, you've laid out so well that that safe space in your community is more than just surfing. You're providing homework, food, mentorship, home visits, parental support. There's so much that falls on your guys' shoulders. I think um, just with an eye on the time, there's just, there's just a couple more questions I'm keen to ask. And it follows on, Chris, from something that you said that you didn't know what surfing was doing. Um, and it's a question I've got for Messer and for Ilward. Um, and Shafi, I'd love to finish with one question to you as well. So uh, Ilward, Ilward and Lester, we've got about five or 10 minutes for this question. But yeah, Chris, you, you said you didn't know what surfing was doing. And, and when we wake up and we realize surfing is so powerful, um, we can start shifting systems. But how do we do that? And I think, you know, Messi, you shared your vision with this network of beaches, you know, creating a new health pathway for young people in Sierra Leone. Um, 
shifting that system needs evidence. And I guess my question to you is how, how have you been collecting evidence and how have you been, how have you been using that to sensitize the bigger players that you talk to? So I know that you, you know, you and Ilwad engage in some amazing um, forums, you know, the, the World Economic Forum, the, you know, the Nobel Forums, the UN, Messer, you had this fantastic letter that you sent from the president of Sierra Leone ordering surfboards to be released from uh, Freetown Court. That's, I think it's my favorite letter of all time. But you guys are, you know, you're creating systems and you're talking to the people that can create those. Yeah, Messer, how, how are you doing that? Like, tell us a little bit about what gives you the confidence to go to the president of Sierra Leone and talk to him about surf therapy and why they should pay attention to it. Thanks, Tim. Um... So it's just, it's beyond the presidency, it's a national issue. So it involves uh, ministers and it involves local communities who are really very passionate about something we are bringing into a country that has not existed. And it's a country that is very much keen to now empower, you know, the young people who have really experienced very difficult um, situations in the past with the war and all the other um, crises we've experienced. So, 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 so the motivation here is, Tim, it's, it's beyond just something. It's, you know, the banana culture we talk about, the one pot culture, the one word culture, and, and the power that young people have to make a difference, to lead changes in our local communities. That is what we are seeing, and that is what the Wave Alliance and the soft therapy is bringing. When you go across the beaches, you see young people leading these sessions, very passionate mm -hmm. and keen to make a difference in their lives because it's something they've not experienced before. And so we are in a position we are in, you know, you have to listen to us or you know, nobody listened to us. It is the government's responsibility to support these local communities. And so we are very pleased that the Ministry of Tourism, the National Tourist Board, the Ministry of Gender and Children's Affairs, you know, even the Ministry of Finance that helped to, 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 to support our soft board to go into the country, you know, shows that there is a huge interest and to empower, to engage young people. And so we are sharing that around. You know, more recently we had a group of, of, of our coaches and mentors participating in a huge um, TV program in Sierra Leone at the African Young Voices. And you can see the interest, the local interest, the national interest about um, the impact and importance of soft therapy in Sierra Leone. Just now I was speaking to one of the coaches and he said to me that there's a child in, for example, in the Toke community that will always go to the parents and say, when are we going to have another session? So when you see children asking and trying to be part, feeling belonging to be part of a program, it shows it's evident that we are offering the best. You know, the data is good. Um, the figures, the facts, whatever is good. But the human connection is is beyond data. It's beyond <laughs> it's beyond the, it's beyond the numbers. When when you see people coming to the beaches in numbers, children crying, asking their parents that they want to come to soft therapy, and they go home very happy. One of the local mentors told me that why he goes to the beach every day is because there is so much joy, the happiness he sees in the faces of the children. And also the, the, the diversity in the program that we run. It's not just about boys, it's also about girls. You have women and men. Something is traditionally in Sierra Leone. In fact, it's not in Sierra Leone, it's for boys. And so if we, they have this tradition that, you know, we should not go to the water because it's risky. If you go to the water, you, you, you like something will happen to you. So the parents sometimes are very reluctant. But what we did when we introduced the soft therapy program in Sierra Leone is to allow the parents to lead, the local communities, the leaders. So we really have to pay special tribute to the communities that have really come together to push the soft therapy program in Sierra Leone. And some of the community leaders are coaches, are mentors, like for example, local chiefs, headmen, wedding men are leading the program to young people. So it's huge and that is the motivation, not just to speak to the president or the minister of Sierra Leone, but even to go at the United Nations level to, to let the world hear us we have to bang and bang and tell them that this is helping, it's making a difference. 
I appreciate there is a struggle with resources. There are limited resources, even with visible illnesses, like what if you are injured. But the invisible one, the mental that people don't see, it affects young people. It, it really creates a lot of problems. And for us in Sierra Leone, it's about human capacity. There is no human capacity. There's no development in a country without a sound mind, sound body, and sound community. So that's why this part is so important to us. And it's something we are very grateful to Ways for Change, to team for leading this movement. We are with you. Thank you. <laughs> Messi, your WhatsApp group just blew up. My phone is now getting lots of messages. I'm trying not to get distracted. But I think um, <laughs> some of you said the superpowers, they can't ignore us. I know that um, when you say the data is good, I know that you're, you've been you know, doing research and you've got the papers, you've got the studies now to prove what you do. Um, and I know that they're now shareable online and things like that. So if you search Messaleone Trust, you've got those evaluations and, and the, the data is amazing. But like you said, I think it's that human connection as well. Like you can see that, um, you know, the beaches, the government's now given you space to store your surfboards and to base everything. But it, and the government's given you that not because of anything other than the community leaders, the, the chiefs in the area saying, we want this program for our community. And when the community speaks, people listen there's such a powerful vision that as well I think often you know we go with the data and we go with the research and, and sometimes it's the human connection that's so powerful um so thank you for yeah thank you for reinforcing that I think it's a really good point um I think Ilwad again just conscious of time you you also talk in some pretty big forums and I think it speaks to one of the questions in the Q&A about how how do we keep surfing from seeming frivolous and and unserious you know in a in places such as Sierra Leone and in, in Somalia and in, and in Trinidad, you know, where you've got such kind of critical needs, uh, you know, basic healthcare is not there, basic education is not there. And then you introduce surfing. How do you get people to take it seriously? You know, we, we want to build the system. We want to build a healthcare system. We think that surfing can be part of that. How are you going about talking to these big leaders about surf therapy? Like, what do you talk to them about? How, where does your confidence come from to speak to these people? I think this is a real issue that we face often. And it's not only surf therapy, it's arts, any kind of sport, anything that takes any kind of risk, especially working in a conflict zone, it's very hard to get people to, to believe in it and to invest in it. And what we've done with a lot of our novel work, like for example, the first rape crisis center in Somalia that we set up, it was next to impossible to get any funding for a safe house. Practitioners, donors would argue that if you set up a safe house, it will be targeted. The likelihood of the women that go there being attacked because they go to this place that has given them refuge is very high. Our argument was that could happen, but that very well could not happen and these women could get safety and sustenance and shelter, and we weren't able to get any support. So we set it up ourselves. Surf therapy, you know how that started. You guys sent us over some surfboards, you emailed us the curriculum, and we did it on our own. When there is traction, when we have a proof of concept, and we have evidence, I think it's easier to get people to buy into it. But I think there's a strong need to shift the narrative from sports and alternative mental health techniques to not just being a fun, an option, but a fundamental priority. If we want to break the cycle of conflict, we have to invest in people's mental health and well-being. And that's not just something that should be afforded to societies that have already healed or are developed. And that's the argument that we make all the time. Our first interest in surf therapy really did come from reading a lot of literature about war veterans in the US that were using surf therapy to um, treat PTSD and that forced us to think how could that apply to a context of an ongoing conflict when there is no P in the traumatic stress it's constant it's ongoing you're coping you're evolving you're constantly surviving what can this tool that's creating impact in other places serve our community and when we band together with people who get it like you like the international surf organization, Chris and Messe, and we share what we know, 
-hmm. and develop the evidence base, I think then people jump on the bad wagon. And we need to keep saying this to everyone that will listen, whether that's governments, brands, um, individual philanthropists, but it's really important that I think we continue to challenge the status quo because when we don't, we have situations like Somalia where the conflict just protects to three decades where children are inheriting hate. And um, yeah. Ilwa, yeah, well it, it's such a powerful statement that I think is such a good way to, to slowly draw us to a close. The idea that um, you know, we need to band together um, and share what we know. And when we band together and we share what we know, you're saying people listen and that's how we change the status quo. And I, I suppose that's a, a great um, vision for what ISTO is trying to do. If you look at the people that have been speaking on this panel and all the panels that have come before and what Chris is, all the strings that Chris is pulling in Los Angeles to get us all together. You know, if we all speak together, it means that when you go to the UN and, and Messi, you go into the Commonwealth, um, you know, and, and us on the beach in South Africa and Chris on the beach in Trinidad, like people do listen and it makes all of our jobs easier, but it takes us speaking together, sharing what we know. I know that all of you have done amazing evaluations with the assistance of Jamie and, and local universities. When we share that, you know, surfing becomes that standard form of care, which is, which is what we're looking for. So, Lord, I think, thank you so much for wrapping that up. It's a, a really strong vision um, and I hope we can achieve it and, and, you know, we can support your vision as well. I think, um, I think we're almost out of time. Shafi, do you mind if I ask you one question to finish on? I know, I know you've been, um, You've been listening and I know English is your second language. I, and I know that I haven't asked you this question or asked you to prepare. So hopefully it's okay. All of us, I think all of us remember how it felt when we first went surfing, when we first caught our first wave, we remember what it felt like. What did it feel like for you when you first went surfing? Yeah, it's cool. Th thank you, and Tim. You know, in surfing, it's a new for me, the first time I saw. And previously I used to have a training for yoga. And as a, as a, my experience of yoga is that helped me to have a serving. It was amazing to experience serving. The first time I saw it, it what proposed to me to have a training with surf serving. And I got lucky about the opportunity and I, and whereas I was very happy because I saw every time the movies for surfboard and some of the actors. <laughs> this was amazing. And then and this was also very interesting to me. I was, I'm, I'm, working, I'm, I'm working with the children. And that's is that I was using a tool, as a tool to this, my children, my, my friends also, I can say my friends, my participants, to overcome what they have in the past. And then it's a self therapy. It was helped me a lot to to do counseling sessions in the beach, and it was helpful for everyone around me. Thank you, Jaffe. Thank you. I think the fact that it's helped you do counseling sessions at the beach. You know, when we take into account what Chris and Mess and Ill have been sharing about there just not being any services. And by introducing surf therapy, you've got a counseling service at your beach. And if we think about what, um, uh, what Chris was saying about having one, you know, one hospital in Trinidad, all of a sudden, if you imagine in Mogadishu, you now have a counseling session at the beach, somewhere that children wanna go that's friendly for them. Shafi, well done. I just, yeah, I just wanna applaud you and just say, keep doing what you're doing. I think what you're doing is, is amazingly impressive. Um, I can't imagine how difficult and how much perseverance it takes for you to go there every week. So yeah, just from all of us um, and on behalf of everyone, just thank you very much for, for what you do at the beach. It's, it's awesome to follow you. What I promised to do, I'm gonna share some of your photos that you shared with me in the Hoover app uh, after this. So I'll, I'll put them on, um, if anyone wants to see what surf therapy looks like on, um, on Lido Beach, go onto the Hoover app and I'll post some pictures after this. But um, yeah, just, just to all of you, to Chris Messer, Shafi, Ilwad, Messer, Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for your time. To so everyone on the on the call who joined the session, thank you as well for, for giving us your time. I hope it was informative. Um, yeah, thank you. And we'll see you on the next session. And yeah, just to everyone on the panel, good luck. You're all building these systems and you've got a hell of a journey ahead of you. And we're very, very fortunate to work together. Very, very stoked to call you all colleagues and friends. So um, we'll see you, see you on the phone soon.
Cheers. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you. Everybody. Thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll finish live. <laughs> Nessa, thank you.